This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Neat Sahone, and it's Wednesday, and that means it's time for another deck history video. In this series, I look at the history of deck archetypes that have been successful at Magic's highest level of competition, starting from the first time a particular deck emerged and ending with the modern day. As usual, I let the viewers decide the topic of this video in a poll, and Birthing Pod came out victorious. Like a lot of decks, Birthing Pod gets its name from the card that is central to the deck's strategy. Birthing Pod is an artifact from New Phyrexia that comes with the ability to sacrifice creatures and then search up any creature in your deck with the mana value one higher and put it directly into play. At first glance, this might seem like it's a little slow and clunky, but the presence of Phyrexian mana makes everything the pod does easier, and it also just turns out that chaining together a bunch of creatures, especially creatures with Enter the Battlefield abilities, is quite powerful. Additionally, the deck tends to run a lot of singleton toolbox creatures who can be great on a specific board state, and being able to find those cards when they're at their most powerful is great. What's more is, some Birthing Pod decks have a combo element too, and the pod helps them find the pieces and win the game, out of nowhere. At one point or another, Birthing Pod decks have found success in both Standard and Modern, and in this video we'll take a look at the origin of these decks in each of these formats, how they changed over time, and why. Birthing Pod decks first emerged in the Standard of 2011. Patrick Chapin was the first player to pilot the deck to a top 8 finish at a premiere event, which he did at Grand Prix Pittsburgh. Chapin's deck was in the Team Recolors, and you can already see the very peculiar deck construction of Birthing Pod decks with lots and lots of Singleton creatures. As I said, if you can search them up whenever you want to, they tend to be pretty strong. This deck was a mid-range deck that sought to win the game by moving up the chain with Birthing Pod, and it tended to ultimately win the game with a powerful creature like Inferno Titan or Urabrask. While it moved up that chain, it would power out useful cards that gave you value, like Acidic Slime to deny the opponent mana, or destroy a problem artifact or enchantment, or Phyrexian Metamorph to copy the opponent's best creature, or get another trigger from one of yours, or Cunning Spark Mage to start killing all of their 1-1s. It also ran a lot of creatures who could make you mana. The only two creatures the deck runs a full four of are Birds of Paradise and Lotus Cobra. That kind of mana helped you get the pod down quickly, and it also meant that if you didn't keep a pod in play, you could still ramp into some of your bigger threats. This plan of moving up the chain and getting value and searching up silver bullets along the way would go on to be one of Birthing Pod's most well-known characteristics. After Chapin's Top 8, 2011 was a year with a lot of different versions of Birthing Pod. While the central strategy was largely the same, sacrificing things to Birthing Pod to search up other things, the overall game plan was not always the same. Later in 2011, a significantly different kind of Birthing Pod deck top-aided Grand Prix Hiroshima in the hands of Koichi Tanaka. For one thing, this version of the deck was in the band colors, and for another, this version of the deck was more focused on eventually getting out super powerful high mana threats, so it generally focused even more on chaining things together with the pod quickly, with one of the deck's plans being to ultimately get Elish Norn into play, at which point it was pretty challenging for the opponent to win. The deck still ran a few silver bullet cards good in specific situations, but it ran far more cards that were more useful on just about any board state. In addition to LS Norn, the deck ran Frost Titan, Sun Titan, Worm Coil Engine, and Archon of Justice. In addition to that, the deck ran some cheaper creatures who comboed quite well with the pod, including both Blade and Wing Splicer, who gave you a body that would stick around even after the Splicer was sacrificed to the pod. Obviously, this version of the deck had a significantly higher curve than Chapin's, and as a result it went deeper on running ramps so that the deck could still function without the pod. In addition to running mana dorks like Birds of Paradise and Avacyn's Pilgrim, the deck also ran Viridian Emissary and Solemn Simulacrum. Both of these gave you the value of getting you more mana, while also being good things to sacrifice to the pod to continue to move up the chain. Birthing Pod would pick up its first Pro Tour Top 8 at Pro Tour Dark Ascension in 2012, where Lucas Blohan piloted his Naya Pod deck to a Top 8. Obviously, this deck is in a different color combination than either Chapin or Tanaka's. In some ways, though, this version of Pod took the best elements of both Chapin and Tanaka's decks. It didn't run as many big, expensive creatures as Tanaka's, with only one copy each of Elish Norn, Inferno Titan, and Worm Coil Engine really falling into that category. Instead, it went way deeper on creatures that add something to the board that can be sacrificed to the pod. Basically, it was interested in more creatures like Blade Splicer. 
This meant running a full four blade splicers as well as Huntmaster of the Fells, a powerful and then recently printed card that gave you life and a wolf token when it entered, so sacrificing it didn't really put you behind on board. The deck also ran four copies of Stranglerout Geist, a nice aggressive creature who came with Undying, which meant it would come back bigger when you sacrificed it to the pod and you'd still get to search up a three drop like Blade Splicer. Chaining through your whole deck for cards that leave something on the board even after being sacrificed is pretty darn powerful, and that's what this deck really focused in on, in a way that neither Chapin nor Tanaka did. Blohan's version of the deck would go on to be the dominant one in the standard of 2012, though the deck did change as new cards were added to it. For example, Richmond Tan piloted a Nyapod deck to a top 8 finish at Grand Prix Manila, and it added two recently printed cards that fit with the pod perfectly. One of these was Restoration Angel. The deck was already loaded up with Enter the Battlefield abilities, and Restoration Angel gave the deck yet another way to rebuy those powerful effects. The other was Zealous Conscripts, which you could search up at an opportune time to help you do lethal, but it had a variety of other interesting uses. If you had an untapped birthing pod, you could then sacrifice the creature you stole with it, which was especially devastating, and you could also just use it to untap your pod and use the pod again to search up something else like one of your powerful six drops. Still, even with those changes, the deck was not markedly different from what came before, and that would continue to be the case until October 2012, when new Phyrexia rotated out of the format, which meant it was the end of Birthing Pod decks in Standard. However, the story of Birthing Pod wasn't over. It would go on to a lot of success in Modern, even more success than it had ever achieved in Standard. The success was largely the result of Modern's larger card pool, which powered up the deck significantly. Not only did this mean that there were more powerful singleton cards to search up, the larger card pool also gave pod decks ways to assemble creature-based combos that could just end the game immediately. All of this means that modern birthing pod decks look significantly different than their standard counterparts. Andrew Cuneo was the first to pilot a birthing pod deck to a top 8 finish in modern, and he did it at Grand Prix Lincoln in 2012. You can immediately see some significant differences here. Most of the creatures in the deck are completely different from what we saw in Standard. As you can see, the deck still utilized a bunch of singleton cards that were nice to search up in specific situations. We don't need to go through all of them, but some new ones here include Eternal Witness, who can just return important cards to your hand, including things you sacrifice to your pod, and Linvala, Keeper of Silence, who could shut down creatures with activated abilities. However, what made the deck so different from its predecessors is that it contains creatures that, if you get them all into play, you just win. This combo involved Malira, Silvok Outcast, and either Murderous Redcap or Kitchen Finks, and Viscera Seer. If you sacrifice one of these Persist creatures, they would just keep coming back since Malira would keep the minus one minus one counter from being placed on the creature. So if you sacrifice one of them to Viscera Seer, you could create a loop where you either do enough damage to your opponent to kill them with Murderous Redcap, or gain so much life that your opponent can never beat you with Kitchen Finks. Now, a three-card combo like that would not normally be ideal in Magic. You usually want two-card combos, even with the redundancy of both the Red Cap and the Finx. However, Birthing Pod, along with Court of Calling, made it much easier to assemble this combo than you might think. Those two cards could both search up virtually any card you wanted on many boards, so the combo could be assembled before you knew it. The combo was such a big part of the deck that this version of Pod is usually called Malira Pod. Now, the deck was not completely all in on this combo. It also just ran lots of reasonably efficient creatures and value cards that could just win the game in a more traditional mid-rangey way. That's one of the things that made the deck so good. If you tried too hard to shut down their combo, you might just realize they have an imposing board that can kill you the traditional way. The deck could operate on two axes at once, and that made it hard to counter. This would go on to be the M.O. of Birthing Pod decks during their time in Modern. However, that's not to say the deck remained the same for as long as it was in Modern. Later in 2012 at Grand Prix Yokohama, three of the top eight decks were Malira Angel Pod decks, and the name change reflects the fact that the deck now ran two separate combos. The deck still runs the combo with Persist Creatures and Malira, but it also added the Restoration Angel Kiki Jiki combo. If you got both of those in play, you could tap Kiki Jiki to copy the Angel, and then the Angel would untap Kiki Jiki, and you could do it as many times as you wanted until you felt you had enough Angels with haste to send at your opponent to win the game. One of the great things about these two new cards and the addition of this combo is that even independent of the combo, these two cards function pretty well in the deck. Restoration Angel can blink all of your sweet Enter the Battlefield creatures, and Kiki Jiki can get you more Enter the Battlefield triggers too, 
and you could also sacrifice the copy to your pod without really losing anything. Some other versions of the deck ran either the Malira combo or the Restoration Angel combo and not both. If a deck was more of an Angel pod deck, it ran some other things that could combo with Kiki-Jiki. For example, in 2013, Ari Lax piloted an Angel pod deck to a top 8 finish, and he also added in Deceiver Exarch, which gave you another combo piece that would give you infinite creature tokens if you got Kiki-Jiki into play with it. Later in 2013, another new combo made its way into Birthing Pod decks. Josh McLean won Grand Prix Detroit that year with a version of Birthing Pod that didn't utilize Restoration Angel or Kiki-Jiki at all. It ran the Malira combo, but complemented that with the Archangel of Thune and Spike Feeder combo. If you got both of them in play, you could remove a counter from the feeder to gain two life, at which point the Angel would put a counter on all of your creatures, which you could then remove from the feeder to gain two life. This combo allowed you to make your creatures as big as you wanted while also gaining you so much life your opponent could never kill you. Birthing Pod decks continued to be pretty dominant in modern throughout 2013 and 2014 without any major changes. Of course, no two decks were the same, as the toolbox cards you ran in your main deck would change and what creature-based combo the deck ran would shift between the three we've covered so far. No deck ran all three of them, with most opting for one or two of the three. The biggest addition to the deck in 2014 was Siege Rhino, but other than that, you can see the deck pretty much remained the same. Birthing Pod decks became the most dominant deck in Modern over this span, and in 2014, it became the deck with the most Grand Prix Top 8s and the largest percentage of the field, and the format had a real problem of diversity. Basically, if you were going to play a creature-based deck at the time, there was no reason not to play Birthing Pod. So, Birthing Pod itself got banned in January of 2015, and it has never been unbanned. Obviously, this means the end of Birthing Pod's story, but there is something of an epilogue. There are still decks in Modern that have a very similar strategy, though obviously without Birthing Pod, they had to change things up a bit. These decks are often called Podless, a name that does a good job of conveying that it's pretty much the same deck, it just has to do things without Birthing Pod. The first of these Podless decks top aided a Modern event at Grand Prix Singapore in 2015, and it was piloted by Tae Jun Hao. The deck is still a toolbox deck, and it still runs a combo, in this case Kiki Jiki and Restoration Angel. Obviously, without the pod, the deck had to find different ways to search up those creatures. Luckily, Court of Calling was still around, and the deck also added Fauna Shaman, which could tutor up creatures to your hand, and Collected Company, which didn't quite tutor things up since it only let you look at the top few cards of your deck, but it gave you the ability to choose a couple of creatures that are good on a particular board state and or help you complete a combo at instant speed. These podless decks have continued to be relevant in modern, going under a number of different names. More Kiki-Jiki-centric versions of the deck go by Kiki Cord, and some versions of the deck are more in on the toolboxing and tend to be called Cord Toolbox. But either way, these decks are the descendants of Birthing Pod in modern, and they're still relevant today. They aren't, and never have been, as dominant as Pod was in Modern, but they are the closest thing to Birthing Pod that still exists in Modern. So that's the history of Birthing Pod decks. In Standard, Birthing Pod was simply a creature-based deck that looked to use the pod as an engine and tutor that could grind you through creatures that gave you Enter the Battlefield abilities or useful effects on a particular board state before you stuck a really big threat. In Modern, the deck was still interested in tutoring up ideal creatures, but it also added a major combo element that really came to define the deck in Modern. These decks were so dominant that, as we saw, ultimately Birthing Pod got banned out of the format, and it's unlikely it gets unbanned anytime soon. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future episodes of this series, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on all the other episodes, and there's quite a few now, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.